So now we'll be delighted to hear from Jed and his ideas. Oh, what joy. Uh, it, I am... Um, I'm actually really pleased to be here because it's very rare that I have an opportunity to preach to the converted. And um, I, I've just, I went around the posters before and uh, this scheme is absolutely fantastic, no question about it. Absolutely brilliant. Credit to you all. Everybody who sat here today deserves enormous uh, uh, personal credit uh, for what you have done both in terms of uh, your experience and input into low-income countries, but also what you already brought back. There's a lingering question, actually, because of that, which I want to linger all day. And the question is, that my only disappointment is that I'm not talking to an entirely full Wembley Stadium. And so I guess, my, I, I guess what I want you to think about today is why do we only have this many people? And why in an NHS which employs 1.3 million people, don't we have a full Wembley Stadium to celebrate our success? So, um, not much pressure there then. Okay. Uh, I'm a surgeon by, well, I'm a practicing surgeon in fact, but um, I spend most of my time now uh, either in London or dotted around the country uh, working for an organization called Health Education England. Health Education England are effectively the workforce arm of the NHS. Our responsibility, uh, uh, um, our statutory responsibility is to ensure that the workforce that we deliver uh, into the English healthcare landscape are fit for purpose for delivering high quality healthcare to our population. I put it to you that we're on the cusp of a revolution in healthcare. Many people have probably said this before, but at the moment, and the picture of, um, I suspect that Ben's picture of the NHS at the end is actually five years old, because I think it's much worse than that. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have an issue with demographics, ageing population. We've got an issue with increased technology and the cost. Uh, you may have noticed, maybe, maybe not, that there's a little bit of dissatisfaction amongst healthcare workforce at the moment. <laughs> uh, and yet, out of all of that, we have increased demand and increased demand for a, a longer living population. Um, Health Education England has a 15-year strategy and it says the following. Workforce will include the informal support that helps people prevent ill health and manage their own care when appropriate. The skills, values and behaviours required to provide co-productive and traditional models of care as appropriate. We'll have adaptable skills responsive to evidence and innovation to enable whole person care. We'll have the skills, values, behaviours and support to provide safe, high quality care whenever, uh, wherever and whenever the patient is, at all times and in all settings and deliver the NHS constitution. Now, I, um, I'm just going to, I'm an educationalist fundamentally, I'm a medical educationalist. Just going to draw you back to learning, okay. Fundamentally, there are three elements to uh, learning. There's what you learn, the curriculum, there's who teaches you, the teacher, and where you learn, the learning environment. And what we tend to do is if something's broke, we concentrate on the curriculum, we introduce uh, all sorts of new uh, learning outcomes, things that we should learn. The problem is it doesn't make any bloody difference. Because what we learn does not necessarily affect the way in which we behave. What's far, far more important is who teaches us, who role models us. And yet the role of teacher in the NHS has diminished over the last 25 years because we don't metricate it, we don't pay for it. And not only that, but the learning environment has a massive impact on how we behave uh, as uh, clinicians and health professionals. And yet we never focus on improving this. Now, in addition to that, um, we, we've got this feeling, and you're proving this, we've got this feeling that when we go and work in low-income countries, it's a good thing. It's not only a good thing for... Uh, uh, because there is a demand for uh, westernised healthcare within low-income countries, but it's a good thing for us in terms of personal development. It's not a new thing. We've been doing it since the days of Livingston, <laughs> not terribly successfully at times, but we have been doing it. Um, but very often it's voluntary, it's in career breaks, it's part of an elective, it tends to be medically dom uh, dominated, very often within a charitable framework. But it's virtually impossible to meet anybody who's worked in a low-income country that says they learned nothing whilst they were there. If you read the NHS five-year forward view, 
the Bible that we're working for at the moment. It fundamentally says one thing, that what we have to do is we have to change a medicalised model of care and move that model of care into one which gives the population ownership of their own health and well-being. And in order to do that, the health professional has to develop a whole series of transferable skills. Leadership, public health, teamwork, equality and diversity, communication, patient safety, value for money, wellness, cultural competence, infectious disease. When you talk to anybody at all who's worked in a low-income country, what do they say? Well, I learned an awful lot about leadership, ten times as much as you apparently could learn here. <laughs> public health, empathy, I, I learned about communication, I, lear I learned some cultural competence, I became personally effective. So the question then... Why is international exchange not absolutely routine for all our current and future workforce? Why? Well, the answer to that is that we don't really understand it well enough to be able to convince employers and the taxpayer that it's the right thing to do. We don't really understand the learning outcomes. We've got vague qualitative measures of them. We don't understand the quality we don't understand the risk. We're not sure whether when we send people to low and middle income countries whether, there's an, or whether it's ethical. Um, and we also don't understand that nobody's ever really done the true financial costing. Okay. What we at HGE are now committed to is recognising that learning, the revolution is all about learning globally and that that learning globally is absolutely essential to develop the learning outcomes that are required to deliver the five-year forward view and to deliver appropriate health and well-being to our population as a whole. The problem is that the way the government work at the moment is that we get money for developing our own staff. We don't get money for capacity building. So one of the big barriers to us at the moment is partnership. It's our core business to make healthcare staff fit for purpose. It's other people's core business to get uh, capacity building in low and middle income countries. So it doesn't take a genius, and Ben has alluded to this, that we need to work in partnership. And so one of the things that we've done as HEE is we've set up a thing called the Global Health Exchange. The Global Health Exchange is a manifestation of our commitment to giving all members of the workforce, the healthcare workforce within the NHS, an opportunity to learn uh, in or about low and middle income countries. We have four principal objectives. Create opportunities for global education and training for NHS staff. Develop collaborative international projects to address current workforce shortages. Work in partnership with capacity building programmes and promotes general overseas volunteering. Uh, we launched uh, some 16 months ago now. We invested £1.5 million pounds into uh, the Global Health Exchange. Uh, it's in our current um, uh, business plan, has been approved by the Secretary of State for recurrent funding. Um, what we want to do is to empower and, and engage schemes like this particular scheme to ensure its sustainability, scalability, and growth across the whole of uh, the English healthcare landscape. Um, okay. What have we done so far? Well, we've, at the moment, we currently have 12 work streams. We have a, an education transformation uh, work stream, which includes um, uh, four sub-work streams, including uh, the current global health activity within higher education institutions across the UK. Uh, we've just um, placed 80 non-medical students in Uganda and India as action researchers at the end of their undergraduate training to find out what the barriers are for making uh, international placement part of core tr undergraduate training for nurses and allied health professionals. Uh, we've just extended a scheme which was designed by Robin Weil in um, uh, the uh, southwest. Uh, were rather than advertising for a three-year GP training programme, we're now advertising for four-year GP training programmes with a one-year compulsory out of programme in Gauteng province in South Africa, which is paid for uh, by Pretoria. Uh, we're heavily engaged with the all-party parliamentary group in, in uh, global health, and I'm sure that Nigel will refer to that later. 
we're also aware that we can't do any of this unless we get the metrics right. And so we've, um, we now have six PhD students and two postdocs looking at one question, really, which is what are the benefits of international volunteerism and placement to the NHS? Once we get the metrics right, we can create a business ca case for provider organisations, chief execs. Okay. I put it to you that there is a business case out there which says that investment in the National Leadership Academy does not offer the same value for money than sending somebody uh, on a leadership um, uh, expedition to a low-income country for three months. We've already heard this. We have um, uh, developed three massive online courses in public health, uh, which will be released uh, later this year. We've been working very closely with the Faculty of Public Health and we're going to have a, a, a large national uh, conference next year to which you will all be invited. We have a developing leadership and management um, uh, structure, which I'd like to talk to you about a little tiny bit later. And we, ha we house and have founded the Uganda UK Healthcare Alliance, working very closely with FET. We're just starting now to look at uh, capacity and workforce shortages in the British overseas territories. We have a programme in global uh, surgery in response to the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, and we're just starting to generate an overseas volunteering database uh, with Tony Redmond, who some of you may know, who runs the uh, humanitarian response uh, database for DFID. So, fundamental messages for me is we've turned the corner as uh, a nation in recognising the importance of educational globalisation to the quality of care of the population of England. Absolutely key. Secondly, we know that we cannot do that without working with all of those um, organisations and all of those individuals who've been driven by themselves to do something about this agenda. Absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Dan Knights. I'm an F2 doctor currently, um, and I'm due to be travelling to South Africa on the IGH Fellowship later this year. Um, Jed, I'd love you to be my postgraduate dean. Um, I, 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 I share your vision for a, a Wembley Stadium for the people. Um, unfortunately, I'll not say where I'm training, but the message that we get loud and clear from our postgraduate dean is this is a difficult time for the NHS, and this is absolutely not the time that we can afford to be releasing people to go out of programme um, to go and get these fantastic leadership skills like travelling abroad offers. Um, so I wonder what practically, at a high level, you guys are doing and what, at a lower level, we can be doing to try and kind of instigate that change of culture that will enable that to be spread. The cold answer to that uh, is data. Because uh, one of the things that we understand in terms of retention, you may be aware, I'm sure you are aware, that 51% of uh, FY2s this year did not go directly onto ST training. And uh, that is a massive potential brain drain to, the, uh, to uh, the UK as a whole. We do not know what's going to happen to that 51%. We suspect a substantial amount of them will come back. But many of them have a, and I use the term without offence, a wanderlust uh, for globalising their own experience. It's perfectly obvious to us, and some of the schemes that we've been involved in, that if you, um, you regulate that experience and facilitate it, you're much more likely to retain in the long term than you are in the short term. So the second, slightly more tongue-in-cheek answer to your question is that I'm responsible for managing the postgraduate deans. I guess my only risk is that uh, our trainee there may be from Wessex, but I hope to—I hope to goodness he's not, because no. I'm in the same organisation that you are, Fleur, and yeah. I would hope that we uh, share every single ambition that, that Jed has, and certainly every ambition, Fleur, that you've already made come true for so many people across Wessex and across England. Thank you, and that's Simon Plint, who's the postgraduate dean for Wessex, that you've probably picked up. But I think on the other side, it is worth remembering, it is hard. You know, people do have, you know, rotors to run and training to provide, so it isn't a simple thing. Uh, and everybody can't go at once, clearly. So it's recognising that it is hard, um, and we've just got to, again, find data, find ways to, to persuade people who, who, are, who are as yet uh, unconvinced of the benefits. Okay, what I'd like to do now, thank you very much for that, is to open out questions, so for either Ben or Jed, or both, so um, you can either say in your question who you'd like to hear from, um, or we can, uh, you know, Ben or, or Jed can decide among themselves who would like to answer. 
Uh, Rory Honey, one of the alumni from the Cambodia program. Thanks very much. This is directed to Jed. Do you see the new junior doctor contract negotiations and particularly, <laughs> you knew this was coming, you knew this was coming, particularly with reference to annual increments as an existential threat to programs like IGH because of the disincentivization of it? Thank you. Um, do I see them? I, I mean, I, I think any change in contract is likely to provide a threat to current practice, particularly if uh, there are schemes which are reliant on the current contract to allow people the freedom to go and do things that they might want to do. Um, have I actually considered that question? Um, no. Um, but I will do and get back to you on it. I, I don't want to be flippant about it. It's obviously an extraordinarily sensitive, uh, uh, sensitive issue. I have my own views. I'm obviously a practicing doc myself, uh, which may, may or may not differ from the party line. Um, Anna, but I think, I think the environment that we're in at the moment, there is a tendency to be protectionist about NHS staff um, and the belief that by restricting their activity in some way you're going to e increase productivity and retention and I think that is fallacious. Hi there, um, my name's Ruth. I also have previously been to Cambodia, so lovely to see everybody here. Um, I actually come from a nursing background um, and have had a curious uh, desire to work within low-income countries for a number of years, but the opportunities for nurses and AHPs to access these kind of programs are actually very, very difficult. And I just wanted, Jed, you, you touched on the fact that you're going to start working with pre-registration <coughs> programs. Just wanted to find out a little bit more about that. Um, okay, so I... I Please go and have a look at the website and uh, please get in touch with uh, Jonathan. I don't know whether he's arrived yet. There was. Oh, with Gay. With go, if you speak to Gay at the end of this, she'll put, you give you some direct information about that uh, from the Global Health Society. Sorry, Gay, I apologise. Jonathan has a problem with the train, is that right? Okay. Um, so. Um, under, let's talk undergraduate nurse and allied health professionals first. Uh, we have a problem in that the NMC uh, and the HCPC, to a slightly lesser degree, uh, are very, very strict about the delivery of learning outcomes within UK, and their core curriculum is very, very tight. And so at the moment, the only real opportunity we have for grabbing them and putting them in low-income countries is during that elective period, which in nurses is right and midwives is right at the end of training. Uh, we are working both with the NMC um, and the Royal College of Midwives and the Royal College of Nursing uh, to look at what we would require in order to create core modules that could be delivered overseas. It will take a little while in order to be able to do that. There is, I can report, however, there is an enthusiasm for it. Everybody recognises that if you can characterise those learning environments, it may well be something that's beneficial to do. In the post graduate nursing world if this really comes back to place of work and employers and uh, we have uh, uh, ongoing issues where we have very facilitative chief executives of secondary care organizations and uh, uh, general practices uh, who are very encouraging and recognize the benefits of this and in fact are engaged in health partnership schemes and that goes all the way to people who you can't even get a meeting with when you want to talk to them about international health we have to work on that. This is why we've done the MOVE project, really, so that we can present hardened data through NHS England and through CCGs to say that international experience is recognised organisational development and highly effective. Thank you very much. I'm Joy Kemp, Global Professional Advisor from the Royal College of Midwives. I've all about you, Joy. <laughs> I'm you? not going to change how, but I have. Um, <laughs> I am facilitating a workshop later on working with professional associations in global health partnerships. So I have to ask you both the question, what role do you think that professional associations play in this hopefully new world of uh, international health partnerships, global health partnerships? Should we go to Jed first? Or, or Ben? Yeah. yeah Give no, Jed a, a abso break. Absolutely crucial. I think that what I was arguing that um, we need to have an analysis of what is in the best interest of those countries. So we need to start with that, that um, dialogue with the ministries of health um, and understand what the demand is. In that context, strengthening associations is surely a very important contribution. Um, and the work you've been doing is, is, is really admirable. Um, and we shout about it quite a lot. Um, 
and and I I would you know broaden the as as you heard I mean I'm also excited by the ways in which patient activism is is growing how you know peer mentor work is starting so leadership in its broadest um, understanding is what I think you're contributing to individual association etc. I think there are, there are two things for me about associations. One is the um, uh, the informal pressure that they put on the system for action, a, a, a collective action internally. And I think that um, where you have um, a professional association which recognises the benefits of uh, this sort of activity, it opens the floodgates and, and um, um, makes uh, negotiations with employers much easier. That's number one. The second big issue is, is the one that, that um, uh, Ben alluded to, is the, the technology permits large-scale transcontinental communities of practice of, of uh, associations as well, and I think they're really powerful. We, we are uh, just embarking on a little project in Bengal to set up um, uh, a, uh, an IT-based uh, community of program, uh, community of practice between nurse leaders here and nurse leaders in a developing health uh, economy in Bengal uh, to uh, allow and facilitate that constant exchange of information through a virtual community of practice. So, and I think associations are very well placed to be able to develop that sort of relationship. Thank you.